Hi, everybody. Welcome to Adobe Live on Behance.net. My name is Michael Jarrett. It's Photoshop week, and I'm here with one of the masters, Jesus Ramirez. Uh, you may know Jesus from the Photoshop training channel on YouTube. He's got a bunch of amazing work on his Behance. We'll get into that. Um, he's also on Instagram. So uh, welcome, first of all. Hey, thank you for having yeah. me. Uh, let's go ahead and, like I said, it's it's Photoshop week. So we uh, just wrapped up a stream with Nathaniel Dodson. Uh, he taught us a whole bunch of fundamentals. Um, it looked like a really amazing yeah, stream. Some cool special effects. You guys should check out the replay. It's yeah, pretty good. Definitely. We're here with Jesus right now, and later joining us is Shauna Lynn. So uh, if you're into Photoshop, if you're a beginner, especially, this is a really good week. We're going to be focusing mm -hmm. on fundamentals. Um, I know today we're going to be doing a lot of compositing, combining mm -hmm. images, uh, learning how to make those look seamless and interesting. Uh, a couple things today. We're going to do a chat and win in about 25 minutes, and we've got a really cool prize. I'm not going to announce it right now because I want to do it a little bit closer, but stick around for that. Um, it's a really awesome opportunity. And then later we have a daily submission, and we'll throw those details up here. If you want to know what the challenge is, um, you can find it to the right of the chat tab on Behance. Uh, today we're asking you to combine at least two images to create a surreal landscape, a composite image. Um, we encourage you to use Adobe Stock if you have credits um, or want to pay for them. That's awesome. You can get super great images, mm -hmm. high resolution. And if not, there's no problem. Use the preview images. They're free to download. Use Photoshop to combine them in an interesting way. Create a surreal scene. Um, and we'll take a look at those at an hour and a half in, about 90 minutes from now. We've got another creative challenge happening tomorrow. And then we'll do portfolio reviews on Thursday. So really cool, fun-filled week, a lot of Photoshop. Um, so let's get into it. Why don't you uh, give us a little bit of an intro and show some of your work that you do? Sure, let's do it. Um, I think I, you guys can see my screen. I'm on my Behance, Behance page. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Jesus Ramirez. Um, I'm a graphic artist. I've been a professional graphic designer for close to 15 years now, but lately I'm more well known for my training. I run the Photoshop training channel on YouTube, which some of you may be familiar with. And um, I've also been a speaker at many events, including Adobe Max and a, a whole bunch of other events uh, worldwide. Um, this is my Behance page, and you can see some of the work that I've created. The one that I'm going to focus on for this stream in specific is um, the Adobe Stock Make a Masterpiece, which is a uh, project that I did for Adobe. I was one of five different artists hired to recreate paintings that have been lost to history via you know, theft or damage or whatever. And I just wanted to give you guys an example of the kind of compositing work that I've done. Um, for those of you that are a little more familiar with Photoshop, here's some stats that might <laughs> impress you. <laughs> um, mind blowing. Yeah, 1,500 layers on this project. Uh, file The file size is 4.7 uh, gigabytes. And actually, I'll quiz you on this, Michael. Do you um, know what the largest possible size of a PSD that you is? can yeah, you can have? It's four gigabytes. No. Oh no. No. Oh, possible ever? Yeah, like highest. Oh, okay. Two. Two. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you have to use a PSB. B. Yeah. yeah PSB. Yeah, and it took about uh, 80 hours to complete. And this is the project here. And I'm going to quickly scroll down past it because I want you guys to see. Um, well, first of all, these are all the images that I used to create that composite. But on the right hand side, we have the original. And on the left, we have my recreation. So um, it was just a project that, um, you know, Adobe hired all these artists to do. Uh, this is my painting, and different artists work on different ones. And it was just to show you that with Adobe Stock, you can pretty much recreate anything. So those are the images right there. And I'll scroll down and I'll show you some close-ups of the artwork. And this is what most people find interesting, how um, you are able to take a photo and manipulate it to look um, like something else. So here are some interesting examples of things that I use to recreate different parts of the painting. And um, this is a, you know, it was quite difficult finding the type of clothing that right, people were right. using those days on Adobe Stock. I tried typing in, you know, like Renaissance, you know, fairs Outfit, and things like yeah. that, and it still wasn't working out. So I had to get creative and take items that, you know, like that kind of looks like a towel. All oh, right, yeah, so I'll yeah. use a towel, you know. And the one that most people like is this one, which is the fur lining under hats. Um, I used the cat. Um, <laughs> And in reality, that's probably what they did. It's probably like right. you know fur from some animal. It's a little more ethical. These, yeah, these days. exactly. You can just Photoshop. It. Exactly, you can just Photoshop it. You don't have to uh, use real animals. 
But yeah, so everything that I did in this project, although it seems complex, is actually what we're gonna learn. Obviously, this is like an advanced uh, version of it. We're gonna work on something more simple, but all the basics that went into this project um, are gonna be shown today in the examples that I'm gonna show you guys. Right, no so, matter how complex or amazing the composite is, they right. all rely on a number of fundamentals, color lighting and things like exactly. that. Exactly. That, that you need to learn first. Exactly, and I kinda think about it as math, right? You need to know how to add, subtract, divide, multiply. Right. And then to then that expands into doing complex right. equations. So, but this, in my opinion, this is way easier than math. <laughs> yeah, um, and a little, well, I, I won't say more fun because I'm sure math is yeah. good for, enough, for, 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 for a creative yeah, type like yeah. us, maybe. We're creatives for a reason. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so if you want to follow me on, um, on Behance, my handle is JR from PTC, which I thought was going to show up here somewhere, but I guess it didn't. <laughs> Um, but yeah, JR from PTC is my handle on Behance if you want to follow me, and um, same on Instagram, JR from PTC. And for those of you that are interested, Photoshop training channel on YouTube is my YouTube channel where I post at least one tutorial a week, sometimes more. Yeah. So that's where you can find more Photoshop tutorials if you're interested. Yeah. The good news, super special opportunity today. The Photoshop training channel is like full of great yes. content, but like we have you for two hours, for three two days hours. in a row. I think it's going to be really great. Yeah, yeah. And feel free to ask questions. Um, and feel free to stop me and just ask me uh, anything if I miss it. I know the screen is there, but sometimes I'm just oh, focusing yeah. Yeah, on, yeah, on the totally. work. If anybody has questions about um, either what's happening right now, questions about uh, conceptually what's the thinking mm -hmm. or a technique or something, I know we're going to cover. you're going to cover a, yeah. a few topics today. Please feel free to ask questions high or low. We'd love to see them. We'd love to answer them. It always helps everybody. Exactly. I know that is the case. All right. So here we are in Photoshop. Now, this is the image that we're gonna mainly work on during this session, but I'm gonna be going into other little smaller projects along the way to explain how certain things work. So I know it at first glance, it might not seem that impressive, but this composite is actually teaching you five different things that I thought we could cover in the hour and a half or so that we have um, to help people learn how to make composites that seem more, seem more realistic. For those of you that don't, that don't know, a composite is simply um, two or more images put together in Photoshop or other applications to make it seem like a real image. And, oops, for some reason I got that <laughs> Windows uh, notice there. Um, but anyway, so we have um, five different things that we're gonna talk about today. Masking, perspective, color matching, blending modes, and cohesiveness. And I'll go through each individual uh, piece. So that's the final composite there. So I'm gonna close this for now because we don't really need it. And I'm gonna start with this file that just has those elements on their own layers. So um, where do you get your images? I get my images from Adobe Stock mostly, or I take a photo. Right. Um, to find my images, I usually just go into my libraries panel and for example, if I'm looking for an overlay of snow, I simply would just type, uh, make sure that this is under Adobe Stock, and I would just type snow, and I would get um, images of snow, and whatever I like, I can click and drag over. It will have an overlay, but I can make sure that it works for my design, and if it works, I can license the image. Or you can go outside and take a photo of snow. Right. It's up to you. So what I did for this project is I downloaded these three Adobe Stock images. So we have our background. Now, the most important thing before you start any composite, in my opinion, is you have to figure out what the perspective of the scene is. So um, let me open up another file. This one titled Perspective. Perspective. There it is. So most scenes, or in fact, all scenes, will have what's known as a ground plane in a sky. So where your subject is sitting. That doesn't have to be the floor, it can be a table, but that's the ground plane. And then the sky. So, um, perspective can simply be defined as the eye level of the viewer. So if you're taking a photo, that's the eye level of the camera. And one way of finding out the perspective, obviously if you're taking a photo of like a, a beach or something, you can see the horizon line, right? right? And by the way, where the ground plane meets the sky, that's the horizon line. So that's that line here. So that's really, really important because that means that everything in your scene needs to match that horizon line. So if we have these boxes, all those converging lines, parallel converging lines, will meet up at what's, uh, what's known as a vanishing point. 
and that's really, really important. And we're going to see how all this relates to compositing in a second. I'm just giving you guys some context so that when I talk about perspective, you know what I'm talking right. about. And this is uh, what's known as a one-point perspective, but we also have two-point perspective where the uh, parallel converging lines meet at two different points still at the horizon line. And then we have three-point perspective where we have two vanishing points on the horizon line and one way up above in the sky. So an example of this would be if you're um, taking a photo of a building really high up or maybe even looking down on a building from like a helicopter or something like that. But anyway, so that, that's what we're talking about when we when, when I say perspective for compositing. So I have this background here, right? That's the beach. And if we look at the ground plane, we can see where it is and the sky is way up here. You can see where the ground plane meets the sky, right? And then I'm gonna bring in this person right there. And notice that this person has been masked. He even has mud in his shoes, shadows, everything about it works great. But yet, the more you look at that image, the more the image feels off, right? right. The reason is that the perspective doesn't match. So that's why it's so important to um, figure out where the perspective is right when you start. So then when you start bringing things into your scene, you get the right assets because not every asset will work for every background. And um, you always have that in mind. Where is the perspective of my scene? And, and it's interesting because it's so fundamental that no matter how good your lighting is, mm -hmm. no matter how good the masking yep. is, every other effect can be right. Yeah. But something will always feel yep. off, yep. Um, a little unbalanced or unrealistic, exactly. I should say, if the perspective is, is wrong. And as human beings, we've spent decades looking at reality right. that when something doesn't look real, you don't, you may not know what it is, right. but it's in the back of your head like this is not right. So what can we do? So I'm gonna disable the mask and let me expand the panels here. This panel here um, has a layer, or this layer rather, has a layer mask. You can disable a layer mask by holding shift and clicking on it, so that's what I just did there. If we look at the photo of the person standing there, you can see that the ground plane meets the sky right above his knees, mm -hmm. right? So let me enable the uh, layer mask again. So you can see there's a big discrepancy between the background and the foreground, which is what, what makes it seem unrealistic. So you have two options. You can either move him up so that the perspective matches and that already looks much better. Yeah. It feels better at yeah. least, right? Or you can move the ground down so that the perspective matches. So when I talk about perspective, that's what I'm talking about, that the horizon lines of everything matches. Now, it doesn't have to be 100% a perfect match. You can you know, be a little off and it still looks okay, mm -hmm. but if the difference of perspective is too much, then it doesn't mm -hmm. look realistic. So just try to get it as close as possible and you have some wiggle room if, you know, just for um, artistic purposes, you have some wiggle room. But yeah, try not to be too up, too far off or it won't look realistic. Um, and I just want to point out that not every background works with every foreground. For example, in this case, I don't even have to show you where the um, horizon line is. It's very obvious. Look at all these parallel converging lines. This is that one point perspective I was talking about. They meet up right there, right in the center of the image, right? So if I place them right there, right in the center of the image in perspective, he will never be, he won't look realistic because the perspectives are, are too off. He looks like a giant. Now, however, this teaches you a lesson. If you wanted to create a giant person in your scene, this is how you would do it. You would right. get two different perspectives and, and uh, put them together and then you would get that effect. It looks like he's standing there. It looks like he's really there. The light is hitting his shoulder. Everything looks great. But since the perspective off, he looks so big. And you might be thinking, well, what if you make him smaller? Well, yeah, I can make him smaller, but you know, then he it doesn't look like he belongs because the perspective is off. So um, it, that's very important to keep in mind, perspective. So I'm gonna close this document, and now we're gonna go back to the document that we're gonna be working with in our project, and we have to figure out where the perspective is. You can see all these parallel lines. If you like to, you can use the line tool. Just make sure that you have a fill that you can see. So I'll select the red fill and I'm just gonna follow the perspective. And I mean, it's so easy. You don't even need to draw these lines because you can see where the street is. The street is down here and the sky is here. So you can pretty much say that the horizon line is somewhere around there. But if you wanted to, you can follow all these lines and all those lines will end up at that, um, at that horizon line. So. So would you say kind of a first step in all of this is almost like learning how to read an image, exactly. find the horizon line, find the vanishing yes. point, 
and then you understand the perspective, and then your your creative work can actually exactly kind of begin exactly because yeah. everything will will exp uh, expand out of there. Now, this is assuming that you're starting with like a background plate. Sometimes in compositing, you might have a you know like the ground plane from one area, a sky from another area. So in that case, you would have to decide yourself where do I want my horizon right. line to be, and then you have a little more flexibility in moving it up or down. But if it's a photo, then you're pretty much stuck with what right. you have. So we can say that the horizon line is right about there. And again, we don't have to be 100% accurate, but as long as we get it close enough, we should be okay. So that's where the horizon line is. Um, so now that we got the perspective um, right, we can now start working with the next element, which is uh, this person standing here. And again, we need to look at her background and see where the converging lines meet. And the converging lines happen somewhere around her hip, right below her hip. Again, we don't have to draw the lines, we can just look at the converging lines and we can get a, a pretty good estimate. Also, in some cases, if you don't have converging lines, you can kind of tell if a person shot a photo and you know, maybe they were on their knees or they're standing up, because you can, you, you know, as a person, you can kind of see um, if, if something was shot high up or low. So if you don't have those converging lines, you can guess. Right. But a, a educated guess is better than just randomly putting something on, right, on screen. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So so that's perspective. Always think about finding perspective. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is masking. So what is masking for the, those of you that are uh, beginning in Photoshop? Masking simply means hiding or showing pixels uh, based on a, either a layer mask or a vector mask. In this case, we're going to use a layer mask, and if you click on this icon right here, it creates a second box. It's completely white. And if you hold Alt Option on the Mac and click on that, you can actually see the layer mask is white. White means show pixels. If I want to hide pixels, I can paint with black. So I just clicked on the brush tool and I'm going to paint with black on that layer mask. I'll disable the layer mask view to see the actual um, layer, the actual photo. And you can see that I hid those pixels where the areas are black. If I paint with gray, then I'll have a different level of um, luminosity, opacity, excuse me. So you can see that um, she's not completely gone. So that's simply what a layer mask is. It's a, a, a way for you to hire show pixels based on luminance values. Black hides, white reveals. Very simple. Now, how can we tell Photoshop what to show and what to hide. Obviously, in this case, we want her to be selected so that we can apply a layer mask based on that selection. Um, for many, many years, my tool of choice, and in some ways it still is, is the uh, quick selection tool, which allows you to click and drag and make a selection like so really quickly. That's the name, quick yep. selection tool. I'm going to press Control D, Command D to disable the marching ants, the selection. Um, I believe it was about a year ago, Photoshop introduced um, a new feature based on Adobe Sensei, which is Adobe's artificial intelligence. Yeah. And it's called Select Subject. So with my runner layer selected, I can click on this button here in the Properties panel. If I click on Select Subject, Adobe Sensei is going to analyze the image and it's going to try to make a selection based on whatever it thinks the subject is. In this case, it'll uh, be the woman. Now, the uh, selection, as you can see, it created it really, really quickly. It's not perfect, but it gets me 90% of the way there. Huge starting yeah, point. Yeah, huge starting point, exactly. So I can zoom in and see what areas I need to work on. But see, look at that. Look, look at how good that selection is. I mean, just from one click, right? Really, really good job. So what I can do now is with my quick selection tool, I can simply hold Alt, Option on the Mac, click and drag to subtract. And if I need to add, I can just click and drag. And one thing I will say about selections is that I never make a perfect selection right off the bat because it could be a real time waster because maybe the model doesn't work at the end. Maybe I'm unhappy with what the way she looks like and I need a different photo of the same model. You know right. what I mean? So I don't want to spend too much time making the perfect selection at this point. So I just want to get it good enough. So I know it's not going to be perfect and that's okay. And that's the great thing about um, working in Photoshop and with layers. 
that you can work non-destructively, which means that you can always come back and make changes if you need to. So that's the way I like working. I don't like using the eraser tool. I don't like using any tool that deletes pixels right. because I want to be able to come back and edit them if I need to. I yeah. like that flexibility. Yeah, often once you, once I you know, find that I, I get a pretty good selection, I make the layer mask, suddenly this cutout image is in the scene and I'm able to see so many more details mm -hmm. that I need to sort exactly. of refine the edge. Yeah. Um, so I don't totally agree working really quickly. Yeah. Um, and non-destructively lets you kind of play as you go exactly. and continue to refine. Exactly. So when you have a selection active, you can just click on the layer mask icon, which is this icon here, and your selection becomes a layer mask. If I hold Alt option in the Mac, you can see what that layer mask looks like. Now I'm going to fine tune it just a tiny little bit, not too much. Let me just find a good area. I guess this is a good area. See how it's a little blurry? One way of adjusting your selections is with a layer mask selected in the Properties panel. You can click on Select and Mask, and that brings up the Select and Mask workspace, which is a workspace designed to refine the edges of a mask. One of the things I like using usually is smoothing, just simply smooths the selection. In this case, since the edge is blurry and I want it to be sharper, I'm going to increase the contrast, which basically makes the dark pixels darker, the bright pixels brighter, and it creates a harder edge. And if you don't know what I mean by that, just remember that a layer mask is simply a black and white image. So what I did there is just made the darker pixels darker, the brighter <laughs> pixels brighter, and you get a, a sharper edge. Yeah. And I also like using the shift edge which means that you take that edge of the mask and you bring it in or out. In this case, I'm just gonna bring it right in just to try to remove, remove any fringing that happens on the edges. And I'll press OK. And there you go. And I know it's not perfect. I, I know I'm gonna need to refine it later on, but this is going to be good enough to make sure that the composite works on my scene. Which is incredible. It's been maybe three and a half minutes from the time you brought in like a full other image on top to Right. What, you know, is already, you know, starts to become way more believable. So yeah. you can see the scene taking shape. Exactly. Um, what I'm going to do now, just because I want to I wanna point it out, but I'm not really going to work on it just because we don't have the time. Um, I'm just going to duplicate the layer and I'm going to delete the layer mask. Now, earlier I said there's two types of masking. There's um, the layer mask that we just use, and there's also uh, something called a vector mask, which essentially uses the, um, in older versions, you will have to use the pen tool. In newer versions of Photoshop, so if you're a Creative Cloud subscriber, then you have access to the curvature pen tool. And you basically um, can create a, a path around, um, you know, anything that you like. And obviously I'm going really fast here. I would spend a little more time. Yeah, and, and you know, I would go around her entire body, but I'll just do that section of her leg. So once I would, once you go around her entire body, you can just click and drag on these points like so and just make sure you get the edges. And when you get, you know, when you get it all good and ready, you can just hold um, control, that's option on the Mac, and it creates a vector mask. See the mask here? It's just a, a using vectors, math, Bessier uh, curves to uh, make that selection. So the advantage is that you get sharper edges. So if you're working with cars, buildings, and things that are not organic, in this case it works, this is clothing, her hair's not out, yeah. then this would be, a good alternative. It takes a little more time, but you get much, much better results. One of the criticisms about uh, using this technique is that you get really sharper edges, yeah. but with Photoshop, you actually um, get this feather option in the properties panel where you can click and drag and feather it. And this is a non-destructive feather. So I can just feather it as much as I need to, change my mind later, and I can always come back and edit the uh, points at any time. So that's an alternative that you yeah. have. So sometimes this is better to use depending on the subject, but you know, a layer mask works good as well. Cool. So you, you uh, have time for a couple questions? Yeah, sure. I just saw a recent one that came in uh, asking if you prefer the, you know, using the pen tool or the curvature pen tool to create your path outright or using your favorite selection method and then converting that to a path. Good question. And creating a, uh, um, these days, I'm more comfortable doing it with the curvature pen tool, just because I think I can work quickly with it. Yeah. Before, when I uh, had to use the pen tool, I used that method. And basically, what the person is asking is, if you have a selection active, 
in the paths panel, you can create a, a path by clicking on this icon here. So I don't know if you, if you guys caught that, but but um, I have a selection. And this could have been done with the quick selection tool or the select subject. I just used the rectangle to make right. it easy. Um, and this icon here in the paths panel, if you don't see the paths panel, you can go into window and paths and just click on this icon and it just creates it for you. For a more complicated um, work path, I probably would, like for her, I probably would do the the method I showed where I would, I would trace right. it. Um, just because sometimes I, I found that I spent a lot of time deleting unnecessary paths. Um, one thing I didn't mention that I should mention now that, that we bring this up is that when you are using our work path, you want to tr try to use the least um, the uh, least amount of path as possible. Right. So I spent a lot of time just deleting them that I felt that it didn't uh, save me much time. But it's certainly an option for something you know simple like a building or you know something that doesn't have too many too many curves or something like that. Cool. Yeah. Uh, a couple of people have mentioned the Studio Pro, which is kind. Of, I think some people are saying it's like the first time they've seen it yeah, on stream. Yeah. So not so much a question, but I think that's kind of interesting. Yeah. Um. I think um. I, I mean, I don't know every single Photoshop YouTuber, but I think I may be the only one that uses a wind, Windows. I could be wrong about that. At least one of few, at least. Cool. Yeah. Well, so if both of those two questions prove anything, it's that there's like a bunch of different ways to do the same yeah, thing. Exactly. Whatever machine you want to use, whatever path and, selection method you want to use. I find that Adobe in particular is, at least with Photoshop, I haven't used every single Adobe app, but I assume it's the same with all the apps. They're really, really good cross-platform. Like I, there's only a couple differences that I've noticed that are insignificant. Um, but you know, they're like 99.9999% the same on both Windows and Mac. Obviously the keyboard yeah. shortcuts change yeah. a little bit, but that's, you know, um, and that's not a big deal. But yeah, Adobe does a really good job. So when people tell me what's better Windows or Mac, if you're talking about Photoshop, it's the same. If you can, aff whatever, give, if, you, if you're buying something, I would just say buy the most powerful computer you can, whether it's a Windows or Mac, or if you have a preference in operating system, I mean, that's up to you. But in yeah. terms of Photoshop, it's the same. And if you're planning on building a 1500 uh, layer file yeah. that's like 4.7 gigs, yeah. recreating a masterpiece, yeah, exactly. definitely get the most powerful computer. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And by the way, that I would have not been able to create on a laptop. Um, I don't right. think there's a, I mean, maybe some gaming laptops could probably handle it, but um, I definitely required a desktop for yeah, that. It just yeah. requires a lot of video memory. Um, but anyway, so, so we have our, um, our layer mask. And actually, for those of you that are older Photoshop users, I wanna show you guys a trick. Um, so if you click on selected mask, obviously that brings up the selected mask workspace. But that's new, that's about two, three years old. And when Adobe made the change, a lot of people um, disliked it, not because in my opinion, it's selected mask is, is better than what was there previously, but people don't like change. Right. So there's actually a way of bringing back the old refined edge, if that's what you prefer. Um, and most people don't know that there's a way, and once I show it, some, they freak out because they're like, oh, we missed it, that's what we like. So if you wanna use the old refined edge as opposed to select and mask, you can go into select and then hold the shift key as you uh, as you click on uh, select and mask and the old refined edge dialog box comes up. Huh. So if you're, Somebody who's, uh, I don't know, nostalgic or likes the old way better for whatever reason, you, you don't like changing your workflow, that's a way of bringing back the old way of doing it. So once again, select, hold shift, and then click on select and mask, and that brings up the old one. Super cool tip. Yeah. So we're about 10 seconds away from Chat and Win, which is, is a good time to pause and let everybody know. If you're not familiar with Chat and Win, um, in a few seconds, we're gonna ask that you uh, fill the chat up with something, I don't know, maybe, Everybody could say their favorite month or time of year. <laughs> or, yeah, sure. Yeah, so uh, let us know your favorite month and we will select a winner randomly and then a super cool prize that we'll announce in just a minute. It better be September. <laughs> A lot of Junes. Cool. So it looks like, and I don't know if it had to do with maybe the cold, snowy photo on your, uh -huh. <laughs> that we're working, but everyone's talking about like warmth, warmth. Yeah. June and September. August and summer. Yeah. June, June, January. Cool. So chat and win. Looks like everybody's participating now. In a minute, we're going to uh, kind of a reveal a secret winner. So not secret, a surprise winner. <laughs> and that person is actually going to be the new owner 
of 100 free 3-inch by 3-inch stickers from Sticker Mule. <laughs> so I personally think that, I mean, I don't love stickers at all or anything. Yeah, but, no, um, no, no, no. <laughs> I personally think that's a really amazing prize. That name will resolve in just a minute. Yeah. We can congratulate you. Maybe I should get the stickers. I don't have a sticker on my computer. I don't know. There, it's a certain point, like yeah. once you put one on, yeah. then you're free to start putting more and more on. Yeah. It's always that first sticker yeah. that you're like, should yeah. I? And then go for it. I say go for it. Yeah, well, that's why I don't do tattoos, because the next time, if I do one, then I'll be Post Malone and, you know, yeah. like. Oh yeah, yeah. just cover. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lucid Co. Congratulations. You get 100 free stickers from Sticker Mule. Um, so we hope you design something really awesome. Maybe send them to family, friends. Yeah. And uh, uh, just to let everybody else know uh, yeah. whether or not you're a winner, everybody's mm -hmm. gonna get this sweet deal. If you go to stickermule.com slash adobelive19, you can get 10 stickers for $1. So again, that's like enough to cover your yeah, laptop yeah. for a dollar. For sure. So thank you Sticker Mule for that awesome <laughs> kind of collaboration with Adobe. Thank you to everybody for um, participating in Chat and Win. And I know we're kind of eager to get back into Photoshop and compositing with Jesus. <laughs> oh, there's Howard. Howard. Howard Pinsky, yeah. He's a February guy. Oh, no. That's coming no. up. Howard. You should, you should be excited. No, Howard, no. <laughs> Thomas Viana says he's zero for 257. He must have tried 257 times and still hasn't won. But, you know, next stream could be your win. Yep, you never know. All right. So what's next? All right, what's next? So... Now that we've masked the subject, our model here, we have to kind of think about perspective again, right? So we look back at our original image. Again, you can hold shift and click on that layer mask to see to disable it. That's why you have that red X across the layer mask. Um, remember the, the horizon line was roughly around her hip. So again, you don't have to be precise. You don't have to put it right there if you don't want to. You can move up or down. Um, so we'll just place her here for now. And I'll bring the layer mask back up. And then I'll press Control T, Command T to transform, and I'll just scale her down and place her into position right about here. And she's already looking more like she belongs in the scene. And of, of course, you can keep fine tuning it. Tuning it. I, I I'm not a big fan of just saying she's gonna be there forever now. Like at the end, I may come back and move her down or move her up. But you know, I'm keeping perspective in mind. I'm looking at. You know, maybe this is going to be some sort of ad campaign, then I'm leaving negative space on the right for mm -hmm. text. So yeah. you're thinking of what the composite is going to be. Um, one thing that I will do, though, is come back into her shoes and then just um, use part of this reflection because um, a lot of times people want to recreate reflections or shadows um, when there's no need to because the original image has reflections right. or shadows. So you can use those in your composite and then blend them in. And one of the ways that I'm going to blend them in is just simply by selecting a brush with a hardness of zero so it's soft. And I'll just uh, paint with uh, white to bring back, you know, the reflection. And again, you don't have to be 100% precise at this, at this point. See that, how I'm getting that reflection in there? And yeah, sometimes I find it's almost like you want to bring in way more of it that you need and then kind of go exactly. backwards and it's like this back and forth until you've, it's like just right. Yep, exactly. So there we go. We have our, our composite. Now, obviously we have a really, really, really huge problem. And that is the ambient color is not matching, right? The, it's just not working at all. You can tell that she's not really in that scene um, because the um, lighting doesn't match. Something that I usually do um, when I'm making composites is I just create a black and white adjustment layer and I place it on top. And if you can get the black and white adjustment to uh, the black and white image to look good, the color image generally looks good. So you're removing the color so that we can see the luminance values. Um, this is not the way I'm going to solve this issue, but this is in a different composite. What I would do is create something like a levels adjustment layer. Click on this icon to clip it to the layer below. That means that this adjustment layer will only affect the, the runner. And what I would do is just adjust the luminance values to try to make sure that the darkest values on her are as dark as the darkest values in the background, because if they're not, then she's clearly out of place. Um, but there's actually a really, really interesting technique that you can use that may not be obvious. So I'm gonna show you um, a method of color correcting photos, and we're gonna use that to change the ambient color of this image. Cool. So let me open up another document, and 
we've all seen this, right? You, you have old photos, you take a photo, the color temperature is off, how do we fix that, right? So this is gonna be actually a lesson in, in you know, color correcting images that don't have the right color cast, but we're gonna use that knowledge to change the color cast of our model to match the composite. So um, there's a lot of ways of fixing the color issues in Photoshop, right? One of my favorites is by using the curves adjustment layer. Now, um, since I always change the settings on my Photoshop, let me just uh, make sure that this is, yeah. Um, let me just set it to, to default, um, what Photoshop comes with as default. And let me reset it. So when you use the curves adjustment layer for the first time and you click on auto, Photoshop has, I believe, five different algorithm, uh, algorithms that it could use to make an auto color correction adjustment. If I click on auto, the image doesn't look much better, right? But I said that there's more algorithms that you can access. How can you access them? Um, I found out that for whatever reason, uh, some of the best things in Photoshop are hidden. Yeah, right. <laughs> so you have to hold the Alt key or uh, Option key on the Mac and click on Auto to bring up the Auto Color Correction options. So once again, that was Alt or Option. If you don't remember the keyboard shortcut, it's actually under the flyout menu. These three, uh, four little lines rather. How many lines is that? Four, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> four little lines on the top right of the panel. Uh, auto options. But I just find it easier to just hold Alt option in the Mac and click on auto. And that brings up the auto color correction options. And there's actually four algorithms that you could use. And you can click on the algorithms to see which one gives you a better result. I find that in most cases, find dark and light colors gives you the best result. That's amazing. And yeah, in one click, right? I've never known that. Exactly. <laughs> so um, you can click on snap neutral midtones and sometimes that gives you, um, it basically tries to find a, a gray neutral tone in the image. And in this case, it does a good job. So I'll, I'll leave a check. And so that I don't have to do this whole process ever again, I can just click on save as defaults and press okay. So the next time I create a curves adjustment layer and click on auto, if I, it, it does that instantly. That's amazing. So that's what I, I had to do earlier. I had to just make sure that I had yeah, the default yeah. settings, not my settings. So um, I like showing things like this, but I don't really, uh, but I also like showing you what's going on, auto right. what, what is fine dark and light colors, right? So for those of us that have been using Photoshop for a while, um, I started in, in Photoshop version seven, which was, you know, I think it was 2002-ish or one-ish. Um, so it's been a while. Back in those days, we didn't have the auto color correction options. So we had to do things by hand, believe it or not. And one of the things that you could do to color correct an image like this is find the dark and lightest colors. And the way you would do that is by using the channels. All images in Photoshop are created by using the three channels. The channels panel shows them, the red, the green, and the blue. There they are, red, green, blue. And this is basically light red light, green light, blue light, and all those lights together make every color that you see in Photoshop. And we just need to find the darkest color in each of the channels. So with the curves adjustment layer, we can select the red channel and we can click and drag. This is the black point, the darkest point. So we're finding the dark color. You see the, the histogram here? That histogram shows us where the information starts. So I'm finding the light color, uh, dark color, excuse me. Now I'm finding the light color. And I can just do that for each individual uh, channel. And the reason that you can't see the changes <laughs> is because the layers- I was like, one of, of these movements yeah. will finally do it. No, so, sorry about yeah. that. So, so basically I had the layer off, sorry about that. The layer was off, but you can see that when I'm changing the, and I'll reset it and I'll just do the first one a little quicker so you can see. So there you go, I'm going here, I'm going here. And that's all I'm really doing, just finding the information right there. Finding the information. There it is. That's finding light and dark color. Light and dark, yeah. That's it. So instead of me doing it by hand, Photoshop just does it for me automatically. Right. And again, in my opinion, it works better for most images. Um, other people may have different opinions, but from my experience, this is what uh, works. Well, and you have some pretty good experience, <laughs> so very trusted source. Thank you. Yeah. Um, now, although it seems like magic, it doesn't always work as good as you think. So let me open up another image. So I can do the same thing. I can create a curves adjustment layer, click on auto. And it's really, it's better, but is not good. If I hold alt option to the Mac and click on auto, you'll see that those settings are in fact there. 
Um, the problem is that in this image, um, Photoshop had trouble finding what a neutral gray was, so I have to tell Photoshop what a neutral gray is. So with these three eyedroppers, you can see I can set the black point. I don't need to worry about that because Photoshop already did it. I can set the white point. I don't have to worry about that because Photoshop already did it. But Photoshop didn't do that good of a job selecting a gray point. So all I need to do is just click on something that should be a neutral gray. For example, the brick path bricks in this case are generally gray. So I click on that and it fixes it automatically. Yeah. Now you might be thinking, well, why can't I just use the gray point from the beginning and just not click on auto? Well, if I do that, the image is washed out because I didn't find the dark and, and black points. So, um, so um, once I click on something that should be a neutral gray, gray then the image is adjusted. Now, if I go back into the auto adjustments, you'll see that I'm telling Photoshop that the darkest color is black. You can see that the RGB values are zero all across the board, so that means the color is black. And white 255 is the highest value, so you can go from zero to 255 on each RGB channel. 255 on each channel gives you white. So we're telling Photoshop, find black and find white. So the darkest color is black, the brightest color is white. So with that knowledge, we can now use this same technology on our model so that we could color correct the image so that it matches the background. Right. So let me show you what that looks like. So there she is. And I'm gonna just make this larger so that you guys could see. And I don't need the black and white adjustment layer for now, I'll just delete it. And I'll create a curves adjustment layer. And if I make a change now, it's gonna affect the entire image. Earlier, I talked about the clipping mask, which is this icon right here. You could also press Control Alt G if you want to, or you can hold Alt Option on the Mac and click in between two layers to um, create a clipping mask. So you have three options, whichever one you find easiest for you. Um, so I'm gonna click on this icon to reset the curves adjustment layer. Now, if I just hit Auto, Obviously, it's going to try to color correct the image, and that's not what we want. We don't want to color correct the image. We want to apply the colors from the other photo. So I'm going to open up the options. And this is really, really important. This is where most people uh, make a mistake. And in, in Photoshop, you have to be really careful when you have a layer selected, because um, we can see that I have this layer selected, right? But each layer can sometimes can contain other elements. In this case, the layer contains a layer mask. And if you notice right here, there's a white outline around the layer mask. That's called the focus. So the focus on, is on the layer mask. You do not want the focus on the layer mask. You want the focus on the actual curves adjustment layer. So you can click on this icon and notice now that this little white outline is on the curves adjustment thumbnail. So with the curves adjustment thumbnail, you can hold Alt, Option on the Mac, go to Auto, and it brings up the auto color correction options. In this case, you do not need to snap neutral midtones but because we're not trying to color correct the image. What we do want to do is tell Photoshop what color the shadows are going to be and what color the highlights are going to be because the if you look at the background, the shadows are not really black. Right. They're like a dark blue. Yep. So if you select shadows, you can just click on any area that should be a dark blue. Maybe I'm just trying to get a dark color there. And you can obviously select it and then click and drag the point if you need to and press OK. And do the same thing for the highlights. So just find the like a bright, blue and then maybe adjusted and notice that by making those two simple adjustments i already color matched her then i can press ok uh photoshop is going to ask you if you want to save the new target colors as default you do not um you're, you're probably never going to use those same colors right. again for another image right because that's default across any yeah project exactly right? so you don't want to do you that. don't want right. to do that right and then notice the rgb channels you can see the rgb channels here those rgb channels were adjusting the color it changed them so now we may need to adjust luminosity. In luminosity, I can just click and drag on this on this layer, and I can adjust the the luminosity of the image to try to make her fit more within the scene. And so this, you're kind of looking for either uh, more contrast, kind of, I mm -hmm. mean, light and dark value mm -hmm. um, to match the scene, or uh, perhaps in another case, it might be to sort of flatten the image. Yeah, out a it, it bit. really depends on your yeah. foreground and background. Again, one of the tricks is by using a black and white adjustment layer and then I can fine tune the image just to see, because I can see that the darker values are probably here. So I'm trying to try to get, get them as, as dark as that area. And then I guess her skin, 
is about the same values as this area, so it kind of looks like it fits. And obviously, you can spend uh, you know hours fine tuning it, and then maybe come back the next day and see it with fresh eyes and realize, you know what? Always helpful. Yeah, yeah always helpful. Take a day. <laughs> yeah, but you know, just even half an hour just, yeah. just it yeah. helps a lot. So yeah. So again, so like everything I've done so far. I, I can go back and change if I want to. Like I haven't done anything that I cannot undo. So right. that's the great, uh, that's the power of working undestructively because we could have done this whole thing using the image adjustment curves panel and the options are here. But if I was using, this is actually a smart object right now because it's a Creative Cloud asset. But if it was just a pixel layer and then I apply those changes, I will destroy the pixels. I would change the pixels forever. Yep. So I wouldn't be able to undo it. So always try to use adjustment layers and work uh, and work with smart objects when possible. So there it is before and after. We were able to col color match the image really, really easy. Just, yeah. just like that. Super cool. Yeah. Um, I want to take a moment at this point to remind everybody that uh, in about 42 minutes, you might see the challenge submission deadline at the bottom here. Uh, we're going to be reviewing the daily submission. So if you're just joining us and want to know what we're talking about, a daily challenge, it's just to the right of the chat tab. Today, we're asking you to use Photoshop to combine at least two images. Um, but feel free to use more if you want and create a new scene. Um, that's the basics of compositing. Mm -hmm. Create something surreal, something cinematic, um, something graphic, and we'll take a look at those in about 40 minutes. We'll we'll give feedback yeah. on air. We'll you know everybody can kind of see what everybody's been working on. And we encourage you to use Adobe Stock to find your images. Um, even if you don't pay for them, you can download a free preview image and use those in your designs. Um, and as always, as we keep going, like please ask some questions yeah. about compositing. These are fundamentals. Really great time to learn some things and apply them to your design if you're working on it right now. Yeah. And actually, um, before we get started, I'm surprised that nobody has asked about my banana. We, I saw earlier, they yeah. were like, somebody said, <laughs> oh, if you okay. click the banana tool, you get a free snack. But um, <laughs> always people are asking. Yeah. Why don't you <laughs> so why I'll tell at? them what that's all about. So in Photoshop CC, you have these three dots which get you to the edit toolbar um, dialog box. If you hold shift and click on done, it adds a banana to your toolbar. Oh, yeah. If you, Actually, if you want to move to my oh, direction. Wait, wait, you're, there we go. Oh, there we go. Oh, yeah. wait, wait. See that banana down Oh, that's there. why nobody had seen it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. So once again, edit toolbar, hold shift, click on done. But that's not how you get rid of it, so I'll, I'll say that later. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell people later how to I how love to it. There's it. all these Easter eggs yeah. that you kind of have revealed, and most of them are all just about clicking shift or yeah, clicking shit, on all, some things. Yeah. So like, if you really want to find all the Easter eggs, all you got to do is click on everything you can in Photoshop while holding Alt, then do it again while hold, holding Control or Command Option on the Mac, and then do it again a third time with Shift, and then you'll find everything. And maybe don't do it while you're working on a really critical project, just in case. Yeah. But. <laughs> do it Do it when you're looking at a deadline. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you're at the last minute. And yeah. You're just, like, you're just you're clicking everything. Clicking everything, right. Um, okay, so now we've uh, color matched the image. Now, one of the things um, that's uh, not looking very realistic is that we placed her in a scene where there's a whole bunch of snow, right? But she doesn't have any. She ran so fast. Yeah, that, that she it missed all. It missed her, yeah, <laughs> completely. So um, I mean, earlier I mentioned um, that I use Adobe Stock for a lot of the images that I use, and, and one of the things that I use is I like I like finding overlays in Adobe Stock. So I usually type things like overlay, snow, and actually I'm not in the right. Remember I had, oh no, I was on Adobe Stock. So snow, overlay, or overlay, so it really doesn't matter. And you get all these different overlays that you can use on your images, right? The ones that I like using are the ones that have a black background with white. It could be snow, it could be smoke, it could be rain, anything like that, right? So I, I already have one downloaded from Adobe Stock. Um, it's already licensed, so we don't have to spend time going through that process. But basically what it is, is I can just click and drag on an image and it will have um, the watermark somewhere in there. And there's no watermark. Oh yeah, there it is. There's the watermark. <laughs> um, and then if I like that image for what I, uh, for the project that I'm working with, I would just right click on it and select uh, license image, which is right here, license image. And then um, if I have licenses available and it will come up on a, on a screen here saying, yes, would you like to license this? And if I wanted to, I would click on yes. So right now I have 68. I press OK, the watermark goes away. I have access to the full resolution uh, version of the image. But I don't need to worry about that because I already have this image. And all I'm really going to do is um, drag it right here, right above the curves adjustment layer. 
and then do that trick I told you about earlier, Control Alt G, Command Option G on the Mac to put the snow layer so that it covers her. And I'll press Control T, Command T to transform, and I'll just make sure that the snow is covering her, right? Looks like a cool tracksuit at this point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a great design for Nike. We should pitch it. Mm -hmm. um, so the problem now is that we want to keep the snow, but we don't want to keep the background. So how can we keep the white snow and not the black background? Um, you could probably make a selection and, and get a decent result uh, with a layer mask, but that just takes too much time, too much work, and the results are not that good. Luckily for us, Photoshop has these things called blending modes that allow us to blend layers together based on a number of factors, including luminosity, color, saturation, all these different things. In this case, we're gonna use a blending mode that allows us to keep bright pixels and hide dark pixels. In the layers panel, you can see the list of blending modes here. New to, um, if I, oops, wrong one. If I select on, on multiply, we get the opposite, which is, you'll notice that we hid the bright pixels. We want to select screen, which keeps the bright pixels and it eliminates the dark pixels. Well, that's what we want. Now, I should also mention that the list of blending modes have these little dividers. You see those dividers here, those little gray lines? They're actually categories of blending modes. So you don't have to remember what all the blending modes do. You just have to remember the categories. And they're actually really easy to remember because in a lot of cases, the first blending mode of the category tells you what it does. So normal just means it's normal. It just means that there's no <laughs> blending applied. The only way of, of adjusting the blend is by changing opacity, which is the same case for the solve. The only way of, of the solve blending anything is if you adjust opacity. The next list of blending modes all darken an image. So they remove bright pixels and keep dark pixels. The next list is, the next one in the category is lighten. So we keep light pixels, we remove dark pixels. Overlay, uh, that's a contrast category and that's a combination of both. So if pixels that are darker than 50% gray apply a darkening effect, pixels that are brighter than 50% gray apply a lightening effect. Difference could be considered special effects and uh, under hue, we have components. So every single pixel in Photoshop is basically three components. Hue, so what color it is, so blue. Saturation, meaning how intense it is. And brightness, meaning how dark it is. So you can use those components as blending modes as well. And like I said before, in this case, we're going to use screen, which removes the black, keeps the white, and we have the snow. Now there's two problems. First of all, this snow is a little too sharp. So I'm just gonna blur it a little bit. So I'm gonna go into filter, blur, Gaussian blur, and I can just blur it. And again, this is a smart object because we brought it in from the Creative Cloud. If you were just using a regular pixel layer, you can right click and convert it to a smart object. But in this case, we have this little cloud icon, which indicates it's a, a library asset and it is a smart object so we can apply smart filters and I'll explain what a smart filter is in a moment. So Gaussian blur and we can blur it, right? And you know what? That blur was just a little too much, just right? That's not gonna work. <laughs> so notice the layers panel. We have this Gaussian blur label. If I double click on it, I can adjust it. So again, another reason why you should work non-destructively. You can always come back and adjust it. Press okay. So there it is. Now. The next step is I'm not really happy with um, the color of the snow. So I'm going to go into image adjustments, human saturation, and I'm just going to make uh, click on colorize and I'm just going to select blue and increase the saturation just because that's more or less the color of the snow that you see on the image. I'm also noticing that the snow is going an opposite direction than on the actual image. So I'm gonna zoom out, press Control T, Command T to transform, and just rotate it to try to make it match the same angle or direction. And it's too bright, so I'll just bring down the opacity. So, you, you know, you're looking at the real snow and just making adjustments that sort of match it. You know, right, whether it's yeah. blurring it, sharpening it, blurring it, whatever, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Um, 
And I think what's really interesting and something to note is that it's really the most believable end result is the sum of many, many small kind of additive adjustments. Yes. Like no one thing is going to exactly. do Exactly. You always have to consider, does this luminosity match? Is the color correct? Mm -hmm. Is the perspective correct? Right. And these are really the fundamentals that you're focusing on right. today and this whole week. Um, so I think it's great to kind of always get to know, like, what are you seeing? What are you looking for? What looks off? Exactly. And I think that the biggest thing when it comes to compositing is that you, you do have to look at the small details. Um, like just now, like I was working on this whole thing and I didn't really notice that the snow was going the wrong way until like, I think I looked at you or looked at one of the questions and when I look back, I just, it hit me, you know, yeah. like, oh, the snow yeah. is, is not right. So I, I had to fix it. But again, it goes back to working non-destructively. Anything that, for example, there was, there's ways in Photoshop in which I could have maybe painted snow directly on her. But then if I would have realized that the snow was in the wrong direction, if I would have painted those pixels on her, there's no way I would have been able <laughs> right. to remove them. Right. So always think working non-destructively. And I, I know um, I sound like a broken record with that, but as you can see, like right now, I could just, you know, disable everything, disable, you know, bring the background back, you know, whatever, everything I've added is non-destructive. Right. So yeah. it's really, really important. Um, so at this point, all we need to do is fine tune the image, but I'm, again, I don't really like to fine tune until the very end. And since I'm always working non-destructively, I can always come back. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to select this top snow layer and I'm going to hold shift and click on the background and notice that I've selected all the layers in between. I'm going to right click and I'm going to convert it into a smart object. And the reason that I'm doing that is because I can now work on this image um, as a single photo. So I can treat it as a single photo and I can apply traditional um, camera raw adjustments that a photographer would use to enhance a photo. So I don't, uh, so I'm not stuck with the layers. I can just treat it as a regular photo. But if I want to make an adjustment to my layers, I always have that option, and I'll show, uh, I'll show you guys how to do that. D does this uh, kind of conversion to smart object? Um, it's obviously like a non-destructive merging of the layers. Does this signal a new shift for you in the project? You're like, okay, I'm happy with, mm -hmm. you know, the first set of adjustments at this point. Now I'm. I'm yeah. tightening it up and I'm doing yeah. a more, I guess you said, like traditional photo editing to, um, you know, yeah. give you a final look. Exactly. So at this point, I would say that I'm 98% done with this composite. I'm going to apply those final adjustments and then I'll see what the result is and then go and fine tune if need be. Okay. Obviously, in this case, I mean, some of the issues that I would need to do is maybe work on the shoelaces, maybe work a little bit more on the on the blending on the on the on the reflection there. But those are like tiny little minor yeah. adjustments that I don't need to spend time on until because a lot of times um, before I used to spend a lot of time, you know, fine tuning every little detail on the layer mask. But then when you place it on the background, it's not even noticeable. Right. You know, so there's no need. Uh, I do all my fine tuning in the later parts of the process as, as far away as possible. Sometimes I do have to merge. Sometimes, on, for example, on that ma Make a Masterpiece project, there were some uh, cases where I had to merge. Yeah. So I would just make sure that those specific parts were perfect. Yeah. And then, you know, the things that were uh, non-destructive and I could leave uh, for later. Yeah. Well, and depending on certain contexts, I mean, maybe in client work, you're kind of working on a comp just to prove a concept mm -hmm, exactly. and say, like, this is what I'm thinking. Yeah, doesn't yeah. make sense to go and spend, you know, three whole yeah. hours doing every single detail yeah, exactly. when you need to just kind of give a suggestion of what it yeah. could look like. Yeah, exactly. Perfect example. Yeah, it's basically um, basically a sketch, you know, right, and yeah. then you, you spend yeah. hours uh, fine tuning it, of course. So now that I have my, my smart object, and you can tell that a layer is a smart object because of this little icon in the bottom right, um, I can start working on the image as a whole. Um, if I double click on the smart object thumbnail, it opens up a new tab and I have all my layers here. So if I want to move the snow, move her, make an adjustment to anything I want, uh, for example here, I'll, I'll select her and I'll just move her here to the right and then save it. When I close it, she, the smart object is updated. So let me move her back. I don't want her getting hit by a car. And there she is. Nice. So now that I have her in a single smart object, I can use the camera raw filter, which is one of my favorite filters because you can adjust luminosity, color, all kinds of things really, really easily. So 
Um, let me see why is this looking so weird. I guess um, it's the resolution yeah, of the, the resolution. of the connection to the to the stream. But anyway, so we can adjust temperature. If I wanted to make this scene colder, I could. I probably don't want to warm it up since it's you know snowing. Um, I can adjust maybe the contrast, make the highlights darker, brighten up the shadows maybe to bring in more detail in the shadows, or make it maybe make them darker to make it um um more dramatic it, it really depends on at this point it's, it's just whatever your your idea is I, i'm not gonna say that you should always make shadows darker or brighter right, it just right. depends on, on what you're going for um clarity is contrast in the midtone so i will increase that and that just makes things look a little grungy and i'm not sure why it's getting that uh pixelation or whatever it right, is on screen yeah. but um, there it is. Um, vibrance is the way that I like adding saturation. I usually don't use a saturation slider. Vibrance is a smart way of adding saturation. It protects already saturated pixels and skin tones, so you don't blow those out. So uh, if I increase the vibrance, it doesn't look uh, as bad if I increase the uh, saturation. It just oversaturates things, in my opinion. So I can just fine tune it a bit, and that might be too much. I just want to make it just a little bit bluer like that, so before and after. Um, I can also increase the sharpening. Now, when you're sharpening an image, I would always go to the 100% view so that you can accurately see what's going on. Any other zoom level could be, um, it won't be representing exactly what's going on. So to increase the sharpening, I can just click and drag this to the right. And a lot of times you really can't see what you're sharpening. So if you want to see what you're sharpening, you can hold Alt, Option on the mask, and click on Masking. So this is a layer mask. Notice it is completely white. Um, see, completely white. That means I'm applying the sharpening effect to the entire image. So Alt, Option on the Mac, click and drag, and you start seeing some black areas now. So the black areas are areas where the sharpening effect won't be applied. So if you notice in the background here, I don't wanna sharpen the fog. So Photoshop is detecting edges, and the further to the right I drag, it's going to target the edges. So somewhere around there where I only want the edges of the image uh, targeted for this sharpening. So now if I increase it all the way up, I would really, really target these edges, but I'm not affecting like the detail in, in the um, fog here, which would make it look unrealistic. Cool. Obviously, that's a little too much. So I'll bring it down uh, a little bit and Another thing I like doing on almost all my composites, even just a little bit, is adding just a little bit of grain. So if I zoom in, you'll notice that the background has way more grain than the foreground. And you can make the whole thing look a little more cohesive just by adding just a tiny little bit of grain, maybe nine or eight, 10 maximum. And it just makes things look a little more cohesive. And in this case, I will also add a vignette. So I'm gonna click and drag this to the left just to add a vignette around the image. And I'll increase the highlights. Highlights basically means that if, if something is really bright, it won't get darkened by the vignette. Yeah. And I'll press okay. So now I made those changes to my composite. So that's before and after. If I wanna make changes to camera raw, double click on the camera raw label, camera raw comes back up and you can make your adjustments. If, um, at this point, now I would look at the composite and think, all right, so this is more or less what my final image would look like. What do I need to change? In this case, I'm thinking that maybe she's not, uh, you know, there's something going on with the, the, the color here. So maybe I, I would go back in here and go into the auto options again and just try to make her bluer or something like that. Or maybe I don't even do it from scratch. Um, you could also go into the channels and you can make those adjustments yourself. See, that's the blue channel right there. I can maybe just increase the blue and, and drag up. See how I'm changing the blue? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can fine tune it any number of ways um, to get um, to get your composite the way that you want it to look. Cool. And obviously go in there and fine tune the mask and all of that, but you know, you guys don't want to see me spend 20 minutes fine tuning uh, her shoelaces. <laughs> well, just like not be speaking yeah. at all. Yeah, just, just in there. Um, we have a question. Yeah. Uh, do you use average blur on a copy of the background blended over the mm -hmm. subject to make yeah. it fit more? First, maybe want to describe what that yeah. actually means. Yeah, and then I, I've done, yeah, actually, I think I may even have a video on that on my YouTube channel. But basically, what uh, the question is asking is this. So um, there's several ways of doing it, but I think the person was referring to this. You can uh, duplicate your background layer. So Control-J, Command-J on the Mac, and you would drag it up above the 
um, runner. And let me let me just delete that layer. And we have the runner, right? And I added this second background on top of her. So it's covering her, right? So if you go into filter, blur, average, it just makes an average color out of all the colors in the scene. And then you can change the blending mode to either hue, uh, let me bring the background, hue, um, saturation, or color. In most cases, color works best, and I'll explain what that is. So hue just keeps the hue of the layer, what color it is. Saturation just keeps the intensity of the layer, how intense the colors are. Color keeps both hue and saturation, which is why it works best in this case. And then you would just reduce the, the opacity. And um, this can work um, in some cases. I just think that the uh, curves, adjustment, uh, curves adjustment layer method works the best because you can, as you can see here, all, all I'm really doing is just, you know, adjusting the opacity. I'm not really changing what the color of the brightest um, pixel is and what the color of the darkest pixel is, the, the dark and light color. Right, and you wouldn't be able to do what you just did yeah. um, previous, which was to go back and say, oh, we need a little bit more blue in the shadows. Right, For example, exactly. this is a, a little bit more of like a broad brush. Well, right. That's a metaphor, but a broad yeah. brush that you're painting with. Yeah, exactly. Um, Right. Now, I'm not not to say that this will never work for anything. This could work in some cases. Uh, as you can see, I did it super quickly. Um, I don't like to tell people don't do it. There's a few things that I would say don't do it this yeah. way. And so working destructively <laughs> will be one of those ways. However, I know people, for example, it, it, it all goes into what you're doing, right? right? So I know people who are traditional artists who take up um, Photoshop and they do amazing photorealistic paintings. They work destructively all day long and that's fine. Yeah. But, you know, for compositing and things like that, I would try to uh, work non-destructively. That's one of the few things that I'm like really pushing. Besides that, at the end of the day, you know, if this is this going to be a photo like on online or a print, as long as it looks good, it doesn't really matter how you got there. Right. I'm not a I'm not a fan of techniques. I'm a fan of results. Right. So if you get good results and then use whatever you like. But there are certain things that, in my opinion, make things easier, easier. Uh -huh. Yeah. And allow for Flexibility. Flexibility, yeah. exactly. So yeah. easier and flexibility. So th cool. that's what I suggest. Things that are easy and flexible. Um, so yeah, so that's that's one way um, to to do it if, if you want to, by blurring the, the background. And I'm just gonna undo all of that. Um, and actually, instead of, I'll show you, instead, instead of doing undos, I'll just show you another way of doing undos. You can go into the history panel and you can just um, select all the different steps that you've done. So I'm just gonna go back to when I open the smart object and I'll just enable the layer, bring back the snow, close it, save it, and there it is. So um, there's a couple things that I wanna show you that are related to compositing that are no longer gonna be with this composite. But as you can see, we tackled uh, perspective, masking, color matching, uh, making things cohesive. So we, we tackled a whole bunch of different things. Obviously, each one of those things we could spend hours right. <laughs> on each topic, but I think that this is a general overview of all the important fundamentals that you have to think about when putting images together in Photoshop. Absolutely. So let me open up. And while Jesus is opening up another project to show some other techniques, uh, it's a good time to remind everybody that we're about 20 minutes away from reviewing today's daily challenge submissions. Um, again, if you're just joining us, we have information of this about this daily challenge to the right of the chat tab on Behance. Uh, we're asking you to create a composite using at least two images in Photoshop. Um, and, and the idea is that you can create an entirely new scene. Maybe it's surreal, cinematic, mm -hmm. something that you've never seen before using multiple images. And then we're gonna review those uh, in about 20 minutes. I already saw a lot of submissions awesome. too, so it'll be fun I'm to kind of see what everybody's been working on. Awesome, so we're gonna work on something a little bit different now. We're still gonna combine two images together, but in this case, oops, I accidentally clicked on one of these icons. Um, but in this case, what we wanna do is just enhance this photo to make it more uh, dramatic, right? It's, it's a beautiful photo, but I feel that the sky is a little boring and a little plain. So I found this Adobe stock image with what I thought was a much better sky, and I wanted to apply it to this image. Now, we could um, create maybe a, a selection and try to mask the image, but that would take way, way too long, and it wouldn't work just because, you know, it's a lot of fine details 
here in between the palm trees and leaves and all these different things, right? And if I do the select subject trick, I'm not even sure what Adobe Sensei will select, but it'll probably be the car is my guess. Yeah, so it selected the car, right? Because that's the main subject, but I don't want the car, I want the sky. So how can I simply select the sky without, you know, going through too much trouble because there's a lot of detail in there. Um, I mentioned earlier that images are created by using channels, red, green, and blue. So if I go into the channels, you can see that I have the red channel, the green channel, and the blue channel. So you gotta look for the channel that has the most contrast between the thing that you want to select and the things that you don't. In this case, I don't want to select the sky. I want to select the sky, excuse me, and not the trees and palm trees. And I'm not really worried about the car or anything else. I'm just worried about the sky for now. So there's a lot of contrast in the blue channel. And it's obvious because the sky is blue, right? So obviously the blue right, channel is right. gonna have more uh, bright areas. So Photoshop, uh, when you double click on the side of the layer, um, you'll get the layer style panel. And Photoshop has this really cool feature called Blend If. You can use gray, meaning luminosity, or you can use the channels. So I can select the blue channel and I can tell Photoshop to either show or hide pixels on the layer that you're on, this layer, or the underlying layers. You may have more than one layer. In this case, you only have one, so it's one underlying layer. So what Photoshop is doing now is looking at that one blue channel that I showed you earlier, and I'll go back to it so you can see it. This one is looking at this channel, and I'm gonna target the brighter pixels, and I'm gonna tell Photoshop to hide the bright pixels on this channel. So. When I go back here, blend if, select blue, I'm going to hide the bright pixels in that blue channel. See this white point here? Watch what happens when I drag it to the left. See how the sky <laughs> stars disappearing? See how easy that was? You can hold Alt, Option on the Mac, and click on that point to split it in half. So now I'm not creating a harsh transition, I'm making it soft and easy. Soft and easy, like so. And I know the sand and the car and the water is not looking good, that's okay, I'm not worried about that. My concern is the palm trees in the sky. So I can just press okay. And just like that, I was able to replace the sky. I'm gonna work on the, on the other things that I damaged, like the car in a moment. So what I'm gonna do is simply duplicate the layer. Control J, Command J on the Mac. I'm going to um, clear the layer style to bring those pixels back. And all I'm going to do is make a selection out of the things that I want to keep. So I want to keep the water and the car. So I'm going to hold shift, click and drag to add to the car. And then I'm going to create a layer mask and click on this icon here. And there it is. Now we have the same problem we had earlier, which was the, the color of the background is not really working. When you're replacing skies, obviously, the, the ambient is created by the sky. So you gotta make sure that the sky that you bring in has a similar color to the one you're replacing, otherwise it won't look realistic. Right. So all you really need to do is create a hue and saturation adjustment layer and just adjust the hue until it matches the original sky. And you know, you can adjust lightness and luminosity and all of that. And just like that, you know, I was able to replace the sky. Very, very easy. It's kind of amazing to see you adjust the sliders and suddenly things just, I don't know, feel right. Right, it's, exactly. It's like, is it's that a feeling, feeling you're more like, than anything. You almost like sigh, like, ah, oh, yeah. yeah, there you go, that that works. <laughs> um, and actually, I'll, I'll show you guys a trick that not a lot of people know. This is like some advanced stuff. So, so we made our, our blend here, right, using Blend If. If I hold Control, Command on the Mac and click on the layer mask, uh, I'm sorry, on the thumbnail, you'll see that I load a selection around the entire layer. That means that every pixel in that layer is opaque. It's, it's there. It's not invisible. It's not transparent. So what if I wanted to create a layer mask or transparency based on the luminosity? Uh, I'm sorry, on the transparency. So, so that these were transparent pixels, not just, you know, sort of transparent, but not really. Well, if you right click on that layer with a blend if and select convert to smart object, I want you to notice what happens to the thumbnail. See the thumbnail, how you can see the sky in the thumbnail here where it says original. If I convert it into a smart object, watch what happens to the thumbnail. Now we have transparency. Oh, so if I yeah. press control, command on the Mac and click on that original layer, now I can select those transparent pixels. 
And that could be useful because now I can maybe create a curves adjustment layer or whatever, any adjustment layer and just, you know, change the luminosity of just those pixels um, based on the luminosity of, um, uh, on the opacity of the blend if. Amazing. Yeah, so that's, that's one that um, not a lot of people know. Um, so yeah, replacing skies in Photoshop. So if you were to kind of uh, just continue with this image, yeah. uh, what what are the kind of just a few of the next things you'd start to look for to really cement this as a composite in your mind? Sure. So I would zoom in and there's like little details like that that didn't quite work out. I would probably would do sort of what I did with the car. I would find, um, you know, that section of the palm tree or, or am I here and just um, duplicate it, control J, command J, there it is. And I would just maybe fine tune it by creating a layer mask or something like that and, and really get into the the small, tiny little details, you know what I mean? <laughs> Just to make sure that I have all those tiny details. But yeah. again, this is actually um, what makes the difference between like professionals and amateurs that they take the time yeah. to do all these tiny little things. And, and to be frank with you, it's probably not, the fun part is, is seeing the sky disappear right, almost right. instantly. But then these tiny little things is what r really makes a difference. Yeah, you have to really commit to it because yeah. what you're doing is trying to basically fool everyone exactly. into thinking that something that isn't necessarily reality is right. real. No, exactly. no flaws in it. <laughs> exactly. Um, now I'm going to show you a different type of compositing that um, everybody could try as soon as they finish watching this. All they really need is a smartphone. Cool. So um, let me show you this folder. Um, so I was in uh, Paris about a year and a half ago now, and I was walking around and I s wander into the Louvre Museum in, Par in Paris. And I wanted to get a photo of the pyramid, but obviously there's tourists walking around, right? So how can I get a photo with no tourists of the Louvre Museum? Photoshop has this little known feature called uh, statistics, which allows you to take photos and merge them together, composite them together and apply an algorithm, hmm. a uh, stack mode is what they call it. And there's different stack modes. There's a stack mode that looks at all the images in your stack and it looks at constant pixels. If a pixel changes throughout the images, then it's, it disregards those pixels and just keeps the constant pixels. So in other words, you can have multiple photos of anything and people are usually walking, cars are, walk, are moving, so they're not constant. So Photoshop could look at all those images and keep constant and disregard everything else. So I'm gonna show you this really, really cool technique just to remove everybody from this scene super easily. Wow. So ideally you wanna do this with a camera and a tripod because if you move around too much, change the angle and perspective, it won't work. But me knowing my limitations of, of what Photoshop could do, I stood very, very still and I shot, I think uh, here is 16 or so photos, just waited a few seconds, kept an eye on people, making sure that groups of people were moving because if people are not moving, they're constant and then they'll stay. So I kind of noticed a group of per uh, people that were standing there. Once I saw them move a little bit, I would take another photo. So, you know, it could be 30 seconds, it could be a minute apart, but the key is don't move and be very still. A tripod is ideal, but yeah. if you don't have one, like I didn't have one here, um, it, it can still work as you will see. So, um, like I said before, for some reason, Adobe hides the good stuff in Photoshop. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm sorry to say it's, it's not intuitive, but it's really, really powerful. So if you go into File, Scripts, Statistics, it brings up this wonderful menu called Image Statistics. And what do we want to use? We want to use a folder because I already have a folder with all the images, but you can select file, files individually, up to you. So with the folder, men, uh, folder option, I can click on browse and I'm going to look for that folder, which is here, the Louvre Museum, and it's going to load my 14 images. I think I said 16 earlier, it's 14. Um, and you select a stack mode. This is the algorithm. The algorithm that we're going to use is called median. And I'm going to tell Photoshop to attempt to automatically align source images. So remember, I didn't have a tripod, so I'm still breathing. I'm still moving a little bit. So Photoshop is going to look at all those images and it's going to distort them, rotate them, and try to make sure that they all align as best as possible. And then I'm going to press OK. And you'll see the layers panel on the right, bottom right. It's going to load every single image as a layer. So it's going to take a, a few seconds to do that. 
I saw well, and I saw a ton of different um, algorithms to choose from. Yeah, the, like entropy and yeah, there's a whole bunch stuff. of them. That's yeah, incredible. Yeah, somewhere somewhere. Helpx at Adobe.com. Yeah. You can find Adobe yeah. has a, a, a really good uh, website, Helpx, where you can get all that information. So right now it's aligning the images, it's putting them in a smart object, and it applies that algorithm, and everybody disappears. That's incredible. Just like that. Now the image is not perfect. There's a lot of issues that we need to work on, and I'll show you how to work on those. First, I'm gonna zoom in and you'll see that there's like somebody's leg or arm, I'm not sure what that is, here and there, and uh, right there. And that's really easy to fix. All we need to do is create a new layer, select the Spot Healing Brush tool, make sure that um, there's different blending modes, that's a little more advanced. We'll just work with normal for now. Um, if we had more time, I would explain why I would use a different one, but with the time that we have, it's just, it's okay to work with normal. And, uh, and make sure that sample all layers are selected because we want to make sure that we sample the layer below and we're working on a separate layer because we want to work non-destructively. Exactly. So then I can paint that person away and you can see that there it is. And if, you know, if I don't like, to be honest, I don't like what, how that looks like. So, it, you know, I'm working non-destructively so I can come back and try it again. There we go. And obviously I'm not trying to get it 100% perfect because I know we don't have too much time. Um, but yeah, all you would do is just paint away those imperfections and there it is. Now, for those of you that are uh, paying a lot of attention, you'll notice that there's one big issue with this photo and that's the clouds. The mm. clouds look a little weird. And the reason is that, um, remember I said, anything that is constant stays and anything that is not disappears. The clouds are moving, so they're not constant. So we can we have to fix that. So I can remember this is a smart object. So I can double click on it. It opens up in a new tab, and check this out. See that? See how the clouds are moving? Yeah. So all we need to do very easy is just make a selection of any one of the photos. It doesn't really matter which one. Just find clouds that you like for your scene. Go to edit, copy merge. In this tab, edit, paste special, paste in place. There it is. Um, we're gonna fix the seam in a moment, but I just wanna mention that if you're doing this, flags, water, uh, sometimes trees and things like that that are moving, you may have to apply this technique too. So just keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is create a layer mask and I'm just going to paint with black on the pyramid to remove the seam, just like that. And now the clouds look much, much better. That's amazing. It almost fooled me actually because the uh, the result of the effect created what looked like a different cloud formation. Right. But what does sometimes occur actually is sort of like repeat, yeah, yeah. repeated clouds. Yeah. But I see now that those were not the clouds. Yeah, and you might like it. You yeah, know, like that yeah. might be something you like. So yeah. it's, it's totally up to you. Um, yeah, so now that I have the clouds and I, I remove the people from there, I'll do exactly what I did with the previous composite, which is put it all into one single layer, convert to smart object and I can work on it as a single photo, right? So one of the things that I can do is go into filter, camera raw filter, and this is looking weird again. Uh, let me move this over just so that you can see it. This is gonna be good enough. And I'm just going to create like a fake HDR effect by making the highlights darker, the shadows brighter, applying Clarity, which once again is contrast in the midtones, and increase the vibrance. Press OK. And that's our before and after. Now we have one more problem, which is the edges. Because remember, I was standing there breathing, moving, and all yeah. of that. So um, you have to you have to crop those areas out. And all you really need to do is select the crop tool and just drag those in. It's totally up to you how you crop it and maybe even rotate it so that you can get a straight horizon. And um, actually this photo, uh, the end result is my Facebook cover photo on my personal profile. <laughs> so there you go. And nobody would ever know that they thought you somehow got you everybody, know, the, the everybody whole out, everybody yourself. out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was a private, a private uh, photo shoot. Yeah, and it, it, again, it was all done with my cell phone. The, the photo would have, would have been much better if I would have had an actual camera sure. with me at the time. Yeah, yeah. But I was just in Paris for literally 24 hours, and I was just there walking around taking pictures with That's my cell amazing. phone. And, and yeah, so you well, can. I know that that people in the chat have been just kind of going crazy. I, th <laughs> I think you definitely uncovered a, a technique and some tools that. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't even know that those were there, but that's really amazing. Um, obviously can help you <laughs> help you get like the perfect shot even when there are a hundred people in <laughs> right there. how much more time do we have I, I just want to know how much we've got four minutes all right so well, I good got... reminder like if you're if you're putting the final touches on your composite for today's challenge go ahead and save it export it as a JPEG or PNG and submit it um, to the challenge tab and we're gonna take a look at those in four minutes okay so I'm gonna have a this is compositing but not really it's just more like a like a special effect so this is a composite that I did um, it's, it's not um, basically everything we talked about, right? We have shadows and, and the background and all of that. And um, I'm gonna take this whole thing and I'm just gonna convert it into a smart object. And what I'm going to do is we're gonna try to make this into like a comic book effect type of thing. So sometimes I create composites to also apply other mm -hmm. um, effects to. Yeah. So this is a, a cool little one that I think we can do in the next four minutes. So now that it's a smart object, a single image, I can go into filter, filter gallery, and there is a effect called, I believe it's under artistics. Sorry about that. Um, I think everybody on the planet everybody, all, uh, still does this in the filter yeah, gallery. Yeah, like, it's, which one is it's it crazy. In? You know what, I wish it was more like, um, after Effects, we can type mm -hmm. the name of the, mm -hmm. of the thing and it yeah, comes up. Yeah, you know what it is. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, see, like I even, and like a lot of times people watch my YouTube videos and they're like seamless. Yeah, like I edit the stuff out where I'm like, <laughs> I can't remember. Because um, I remember the name of the filter. I just can't, it's uh, Poster Edges. Here we go. Poster Edges. So Poster Edges um, does two things. It posterizes the image, so it just leaves a certain amount of colors. In this case, posterization is set to two and it finds the edges and it makes them darker. You can change the edge thickness or the intensity of the edge. So thickness is pretty self-explanatory, how thick mm -hmm. the edge is and how intense the edge is. So something like this looks pretty good. I'll press OK. Now, I want to just keep black and white uh, lines. I don't want to have the color. So there's an adjustment called uh, threshold, which basically makes uh, pixels either black or white and you can adjust the threshold like so to decide how your uh, comic book effect this is obviously a comic book effect that I'm going for uh, I can press OK now I'm gonna zoom in that looks very computer generated right we it doesn't look like hand-drawn Photoshop has a feature called oil paint filter that allows you to um, stylize an image using oil paint, which will give the effect of um, a hand-drawn effect. And I'm gonna mm. disable the lighting and I'm just gonna adjust it so that it looks more hand-drawn. And obviously, like everything else in Photoshop, um, you have to fine-tune things and I'm just fine-tuning it to try to make it more uh, curvy. And I know we have like two minutes, so mm. I'm just gonna say that's good. But anyway, that's already looking much better. See, look, especially here in the jeans and all of that. What I'm gonna do now is duplicate that layer and I'm gonna disable the layer on top. This layer here, I'm just going to clear the smart filters. So we go back to the original image. I'm gonna go into filter, uh, filter gallery, and uh, we're gonna use poster edges again but this time I'm gonna reduce the edge thickness and the edge intensity so that we really don't have an edge and press okay. And now with this one on top, I'm just gonna do the same thing we did earlier with the snow and I'm gonna change the blending mode so that we keep the dark pixels. So this is the opposite of the, of the snow. And we get a really, really nice comic book effect just like that. And obviously you can keep fine tuning all those um, filters by expanding the layers here, the smart filters, and just double click on them. So maybe I want to adjust the threshold to make, you know, the image darker or brighter. It really depends on, on what you want and the effect that you want to go to uh, want to go for. So this is also like another creative type of compositing yeah. that you can do just by stacking filters on one on top of each other and using blending modes, which we learned about earlier in the stream. Yeah, that's amazing. Really cool tips. Um, people are calling you like Rad Mirez and Photoshop <laughs> King and everything. 
I think uh, you really hit on some amazing tips. I know I learned even awesome. some things that I'd never seen before or even considered. So um, people are really digging it. And we've hit our challenge daily challenge submission deadline. So Perfect. I think we should have some really cool stuff to take a look at. Um, I've got it pulled up on my computer here, which we'll just take a look at. And I'm gonna go to the start. So we do this every stream today. We had a two hour stream before this. We've just been an hour and a half here. And there will be another opportunity after this to compete in the same challenge um, if you wanna do it again or if you didn't get it in on time today. Um, but look, we've got you know, 369. We've got like tons of rows of these. So let's just start at the beginning, the first composite. And just to refresh everybody what, what we're looking at here, these are all composite images. Um, using at least two images in Photoshop to combine them together to create a surreal scene. Um, so we're just gonna start at the beginning and kind of, you know, we can talk about formal yeah. qualities, overall concept, execution, things like that, and what we think about it. Yeah, um, it actually is really cool. Like, this person did a really good job on reflections, which is usually something that's, that's very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so I like that. The only type of criticism I have, or I, I hate that word, criticism or critique or, you know, suggestion yeah, yeah. is a better word. The only suggestion I would have is maybe increase the highlights on the uh, snow, right? Yeah, yep, on the yep. snow, just to maybe even add a little bit of yellow of that, you know, yeah. heat that's coming off of the, the snow. But I do like the balance between the yellow and, and the, actually that's another thing I might do. I might just make it a little bit bluer. But yeah. besides that, it, I think it looks really cool. Totally, I think the the opportunity here is is that complementary contrast. So you have this fire on the water, you have the sunset, it's all really warm. Um, we know this blue, this snow in the front already has some blue mm -hmm. in it, so kind of bringing that up, lightening it up, um, can make a really impactful yeah. blue and orange complement that would make this feel really awesome. But cool work, thank you, Jamie. Oh, this one's super cool. Yeah, kind of a geometric graphical yeah. approach here. Yeah, you know what? I, I, besides, it's super cool. I don't think I have much to say. I think it's really good. Yeah, yeah. Kind of hard to go wrong. I mean, the idea yeah. is that this is sort of dizzying pers yeah. mix of perspectives. Yeah. So, like, um, all the edges look really clean. Yeah. I wonder if, if there was um, any... I mean, I'm sure there was. It seems like it was on purpose, but there is, I see the pinkish, reddish color on the left mm -hmm. and the blue on the right. So, I think it's working well. Cool. Like an underwater scene? Yeah, yeah, it's like Lost City of Atlantis sort of thing. Yeah. In a bubble. The, the one thing that I might do on there is, because um, it, it seems like it's underwater, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like a flying fish or anything. Assuming it's underwater, maybe I would <laughs> I would add more, um, maybe some distortions that kind of doesn't make mm -hmm. things too sharp underwater. Things probably wouldn't be that sharp. Right. So just, just make it more a little, just distort it a little more. Yeah. And, and maybe, too, um, cropping in a little tighter brings what's really the most interesting part of this image um, forward. And, you know, there's tons of detail in here, right? Yeah. You want to look at the city. You want to look at yeah. the shark. You want to take a look at it. So, you know, the darkness of the cave is a good framing mm -hmm. device, but it could probably, you know, doesn't need as much cave and a little bit more of that blue interesting city. And what I would do on this one is kind of do the thing I did in the composite here, which is create a black and white adjustment layer on top of everything. And you're really gonna, like I can guarantee you these buildings are gonna pop so much because mm -hmm. they're so bright. So I would consider darkening those a little bit. Cool. Looking next at Tiana's submission. Oh cool, a double exposure type of effect. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, which uh, we're gonna be tackling here tomorrow. Tomorrow, so, yeah, yeah. We're gonna be doing some double exposure stuff. So we're gonna be working more with blending modes tomorrow. Yeah, if anybody's interested in this style, um, and Tiana especially, uh, <laughs> I know I saw a peek at the what you're gonna show tomorrow yeah. last week, and it looks really cool. So um, definitely tune in for a cool graphic approach like this. I'm guessing the Hotter balloon was the added in. I yeah, would or maybe two two or maybe different the sky, cloud scapes. Yeah. yeah, but it's good when you can't tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Somebody yeah. actually said that when you first opened the project you were going to work on today, said that's a composite. You know, implying yeah. weight. That just looks like a photo, and yeah. that's always what you, exactly. what you want to hear. Exactly. Yeah, I've done, I've shown composites, uh, and people are like, "Oh, where'd you take that photo?" I'm like, "It's not. It's like mm -hmm. ten photos." Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So cool, thanks yeah, for no. this submission. Nice, again, nice like blue, yeah. orange contrast. And that's my favorite. You'll always get me if, if yeah. you do that combination. 
We were talking about giant things uh -huh. earlier. Yeah. What better than a puppy? Yeah, the one thing I would say on this one though is maybe try to work a little more on the fur. I, I think it looks a little too straight, the edges on him. I, I feel that a dog that big, you might notice more of, of the fur coming off his body. And the shadow doesn't seem like it's in the right angle. Um, but I would, I would work on that as well. Yeah, you can take clues from other parts of the mm -hmm. photo, like this bush is giving a pretty clearly defined shadow and it's it's mostly like straight down. I mean, this light is pretty, there's not really a super harsh light, I guess coming from over here. Yeah. So it's almost right, but um, you know, a little softer, maybe a little thrown a little, not as far to the left. And what I think would be super cool on, uh, with this idea is you can see how the light's hitting the house and it's only covering half the house and then the rest of the house is in shadow. Maybe do something like that with the dog right. too. Right, yep, you can see it in the background here too. Yep, and again, use that black and white adjustment layer on top of this and that dog will look so much darker than the background. And then you can adjust it and fine tune it to make sure that the luminance values of the dog matches the background. Yeah, cool, thanks Joe. This is super cool. All right. We got a heartbreak photo here. Yeah. This is a neat, you know, graphical approach. And definitely like, you know, blur mm -hmm. um, is used to pretty good effect here because you have this, um, the depth of focus is so sort of extreme here on the main subject that I think that's a good, a nice success here. Yeah, and I'm gonna assume that that red light was from the original photo. Mm. So a lot of times it's good to see what the, like the characteristics of the photo are of the photo are and just add to them so in this case that red light really does seem like it's coming off those those um like icon things yeah, above yeah. his head so yeah. that's really cool now if that's not real light and he photoshopped that in then even way better right definitely yeah. props for those yeah. details all right this is some uh, Doctor Strange mm -hmm. type of portal. type of thing, portal thing. Yeah, the the one thing that, and I, I wish I would have had more time. I would have shown it. There's like a really good way of making uh, making it seem like light is hitting surface, and, and it goes with blending modes and some of the blend of things that we were doing. But I would just try to make because I mean I'm assuming that thing, if it were real, it would be giving off a lot of light, and I don't think the light is hitting the ground as strong as it could. So that's, right. Yeah, you get kind of a red glow down here, but obviously if this was you know, glowing yeah. and, and and as kind of cinematic and impactful as it is, that effect should definitely be brought out in the environment a lot more. And kind of interesting because I think probably the original photo material didn't have any of the circular elements, mm -hmm. but it's replicating or maybe looking to the photographic um, effect of like the long exposure with mm. like light painting yeah. or spinning a light so if that was done by hand yeah and then you know i just think that's really interesting it's it's kind of an an interesting idea to replicate mm -hmm. that in photoshop yeah, digitally yeah. where some people actually go out there and, and spin a light things, long yeah. exposure yeah all right so that's another submission i think from the same person tan Moy, from before and a third yeah so yeah same thing on this one just i i, I would just make the ground just a little bit brighter where it's making contact yeah. Yeah, and I, I think probably the moon itself, I'm not sure though, the bright parts are really, really bright. And I think that, um, I, it, again, it probably goes back to the lum luminosity, mm -hmm. kind of keeping things blended um, in the scene. And actually in this one, um, I didn't talk about it, it's, it's a little more advanced, but one of the other um, things I look for, um, I talked a lot about luminosity because that's usually the most common issue. We didn't talk a lot about saturation. Mm. That, that um, is, it looks like a moon, that moon or whatever it is, that sphere, mm -hmm. it's a little too saturated compared to the rest of the scene. And there's ways of, of kind of like, you know, that black and white adjustment layer. You do have to work a little bit to see it, but you can actually see the saturation in an image. And I, I, I'm almost willing to bet that that thing is way more saturated in the background. Yeah. So maybe yeah. I would bring down the saturation just a little bit on that. Yeah. Uh, overall, and I know this wasn't necessarily part of the submission deadlines, but I think that, uh, you know, congratulations deserve, because uh, I know the same individual submitted the last three. Mm -hmm. Thematically, they feel connected. Right. You know, you have similar um, color mm -hmm. uh, space for each one. The blue and red is really, yeah. um, I think, it, so when considering a set of composite images, if they are thematically connected or part of a set, 
you know, you also not only want to blend individual elements into a composite to make that one image look realistic, but then consider how do those images sit together? Mm -hmm. Are they all saturated about the same letter uh, level? Do they all, you know, have the same amount of contrast? Mm -hmm. Do the colors look similar? And and I think the idea is there definitely with this set, and it's one additional thing to consider. Well, you really got to work. Yeah. <laughs> So this is definitely kind of like grungier yeah. effect. It's a little, I don't know, hope, hopefully like <laughs> not too morbid, but. Yeah. Um, this is definitely the more, most interesting one out of the ones we've seen so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure the writing there probably means something with the composite. I yeah. can't really see it from, from where I'm at. But. Yeah. But interesting composite. Yeah. It's hard to tell like what, you know, what are the different elements yeah. combined, but they create a sort of a loud, noisy, yeah. kind of like an after dark club effect. Yeah, and I, and I like the energy behind it. Yeah. It's really cool. Cool. Evelyn. Um, oh, here we go. We got the source I images. I like that, yeah. Again, it looks like a, well, I don't want to call it a double exposure because it's really not, but it, it definitely blended the two really. Oh, wait, I see. Okay, I see, I see. Yeah, so. Almost like this sign is a little piece of yeah. furniture or whatever inside an aquarium. Yeah. And see, um, Evelyn actually added bubbles or, mm -hmm. you know, bokeh or whatever. Just I get more of that water feel in the previous composite we saw earlier. So I like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good it's a good use because I imagine these are probably either like, um, you know, applied with a paintbrush or they're mm -hmm. circles and they're blurred. And it's kind of interesting to use right, right. those techniques to replicate something that we know to be real light mm -hmm. effects or something in water or in air. Oh, wow, these, I'm guessing these are either photos or 3D models. I can't tell. Right. But what I like about, uh, I like doing, when I do composites, I like to um, add depth to them. So I like how we have those plants that are kind of blurry in front of us. And then there's the main subjects and then there's more depth behind, depth behind them. So it's really cool. I like that a lot. Yeah, it helps keep focus on the thing that's happening, which is obviously this uh, imminent encounter between these two dinosaurs. but. Fun use of ferns too, like making them really large. Mm -hmm. You know, who's to say? I'm not an expert at all, but like, you know, I know that fern is probably maybe this big or something. Right. But you make it large, and then suddenly it can become a prehistoric, yeah, you know, giant. Yeah, exactly. Thing. I mean, you saw in the Make a Masterpiece composite, you can make anything into oh, anything. Oh yeah, exactly. So, yeah, <laughs> a dinner napkin into yeah. like a hat. Yeah, exactly. So thank you, Michael, for that. Oh, that's a really cool. Yeah. The hand holding, mm -hmm. is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah. They did a really good job with making it, because I do feel like they are there holding mm -hmm. the building. You know what I mean? It, yeah. It doesn't feel like cut and paste, so I like that a lot. Yeah, the, the well, I guess, luminosity of the end of <laughs> these subjects, mm -hmm. you know, they feel like they're standing in this area that's definitely in shadow. Right. Um, so pretty good job of matching. And I like the overall composition. Yeah. This, you know, looks like it could be an album cover or mm -hmm. um, it's impactful, this sort of matte edge and the cutout, um, you know, the use of type is, is nice and modern. Yeah, good job, Octavio. It's good job. Yeah. Cedric. I love like macro mm -hmm. kind of effects. So I don't know if the ladybugs were there to begin there or not, but I'll still mention this. Um, I like that the ladybug in the background is, is blurry. So if it's part of the photo, obviously that's that's what happens, depth of field, right? But when you are compositing things in Photoshop and you place something that recedes into the background, you have to think about depth of field. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm not sure if that was put in there or if it was there originally. In either case, I think it looks great. Yeah. Yeah, the placing of the subjects, mm -hmm. shadows, everything, everything seems to feel really good. It's yeah. not an easy thing to put it in this no. depth of field either, this macro depth mm -hmm. of field, because mm -hmm. you have this really narrow focus yeah. point and then suddenly it goes way out of focus yeah. really quickly. And I think they did a good job with the shadows and the, the people standing there. Yeah. It was pretty good. So thank you, Cedric. Yeah. Axel submitted. <laughs> wow. Oh, yeah. Really, really cool idea. This feels good. I mean, yeah. I feel like the earth is where it's supposed to be in relation as an object in space mm -hmm. underneath the octopus, you know, it feels like, I mean, the perspective is really open-ended yeah, out, out here, yeah, but yeah. It, it works. Yeah. And, and see, cause um, 
I feel that he got everything right. The lighting, the colors, like all of that. Just, just when you bring all those elements together, I mean, things just look good, you know? Yeah. And it's a really good concept as well. Cool. So we just learned that there's one more and we're going to show that. We'll make okay. sure that we show it. I'm sure there were a couple that um, were submitted at the last minute. So Simone here. Yeah, clearly using Adobe stock, which is cool. It's like a close encounters of the third kind. Yeah, I like the green, I mean, the, the green on the, I like how he took the, um, you know, he, he applied his own color grading to it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, and interesting too, because, you know, I see in the final image that the rings of, you know, Saturn or whatever this planet are, are pretty well defined, but in the source image mm -hmm. that you use, you know, obviously you have what is a sun applying a pretty heavy like, yeah. lens flare kind of like glow effect. So obviously that's cut out in this mm -hmm. one, maybe even rebuilt a little or, yeah. um, you know, not an easy thing obviously right. to work with an image that has that strong of a light source. Mm -hmm. So very nice. Yeah, yeah. I'm guessing the little boy was placed on this background. Yeah. Yeah. Nice and simple. Yeah. Nothing. What do you think about kind of sort of how dark this is and I would and probably warm. make it a little lighter just because he's up against that really bright snow behind him. But you know what? It, it really depends, right? Um, Maybe sometimes, sometimes you don't have to even follow reality, whatever looks good. So I feel that maybe if we, if, I don't know. If, if Ryan made the kid's jacket brighter, maybe it wouldn't be as impactful. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, so so I don't know. I would try it just to see. If anything, maybe make add more detail. Because I feel that um, there's too much white without detail. Mm -hmm. So just maybe I would, instead of making the jacket brighter, I would add more darker detail in the background probably. Yeah, it almost leads me to kind of think that perhaps this snow, the ground plane, mm -hmm. and the mountains were actually separate images, yeah. and maybe the white is sort of like a, a yeah. smoothing between them, yeah. but there's other, definitely other ways to do that, to bring in some of the detail back. Yeah. Wow. So there's one thing that I didn't talk about in this session that this person actually did, which is really cool, and that's atmospheric perspective. I just think that the scaling is a little bit off. So atmospheric persp perspective is basically when you recede something further back, um, it loses contrast and it gains the atmosphere color. So when you look off into a mountain, it usually looks blue because the sky is blue and it doesn't look at, it doesn't have as much contrast mm -hmm. as something that's closer to you because there's things in between your eye and that uh, object. They did a really good job yeah. with the bird on the right with that. And I wish they would have done better job with that island because I think it would have needed just a little more of that same uh, perspective, uh, atmospheric perspective as the bird, but they yeah. did an excellent job with the bird. Cool. Yeah, this is a, I mean, a really impactful scene. The overall like layout and composition mm -hmm. feels nice and balanced and kind of just wonder what the heck's happening. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is, this one's cool. Yeah, so again, they placed that, um, is that a monkey or yeah yeah it just closer to us and you know blurred a little bit because of uh depth of field oh, oh this is sorry actually, everybody i could yeah. have been zooming way in. yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah really good job on this one and it, it all seems cohesive the color seems to match everything it looks pretty good yeah and and um I don't know, get all these details Did, yeah. down here and to sort of integrate them into also a really mm -hmm. detailed like forest yeah. floor is, you know, sometimes that can work in your favor because it's like, you know, yeah, we maybe don't see an edge yeah, or whatever, but yeah. um, that feels really good. They did a really good job in color matching, masking, all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic job. Cool. Oh, this one's cool. Open, open all these now. Really cool. Wow. So let's see. Here's the first photo. Photo two. Added a second. All right. It's already ready to be a Behance project. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, really good job on that one. Yeah. That's fun. Fun composition. Is 
So it looks like they added the smoke and maybe the uh, the fire elements behind the firemen, I yeah, would assume. Yeah. yeah, good job. I wonder if they they if maybe they used an Adobe stock image because these are things that you can find in Adobe stock smoke like that that you can just drag and drop, change the blending mode, and you're done. Yep. Same for the fire in the back, so. Yeah, good yeah, job. and I think this one has an opportunity to continue, you know, like what uh, it's kind of graphical and interesting right now as if this was on like a photo shoot, like with a black backdrop, but, um, you know, continue to push this and mm -hmm. add a, a background, whatever you choose, and then see yeah. what new challenges that provides. Oh, wow. <laughs> nice blending between the person and the horse. Yeah. It looks, it looks realistic, believable. Nice. Yeah, that's great work. Just go ahead and see. All right. Oh, we have a lot to get there. All right, we're gonna start going rapid. Much faster. Rapid All right. <laughs> All right, we'll start here. Cool. I always love these things that sort of subvert <laughs> what you're looking at. You're mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, somebody looking up at the nights. Oh wait, no, those stars are actually yeah. like little particles in the water, and it it works well. Yeah, yeah. The one thing I would do probably is maybe do the color matching so that the astronaut has a little green on him, yep. and I think that'll really because he he really looks like cut and pasted right now yeah but if you color match him i think it'll it'll add a lot to the composite yeah and and it's you know it's the brightest element mm -hmm. in this so it, it kind of draws you up there but i definitely think that color matching and some tonal adjustments will kind of help it recede and then there you have these three interesting things that your eye can go between as opposed to always going towards mm -hmm. one one thing Oh, it looks like they're holding a sphere, and uh, is, that, is that somebody surfing? surfing yeah. 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 Oops. Yeah, oh, really cool. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, this is, I mean, really magical. They, re they did a really good job with the masking and transparency and all that, so good job. Yeah. Okay. I like, I think, I think maybe this one may need just a little work on perspective. It feels a little off. And also, um, I think you mentioned this earlier, um, to take hues from the shadows in the background. Yeah, they, it, yeah, it's hard to tell how long they'd be, but. Um, I just, the angle is what's not. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, another case, I think we're at atmospheric perspective. It's not so much that this is a farther object, so it needs, you know, haze or it needs to sort of like recede, but the image itself mm -hmm. with the angle of the lights coming in and hitting the lens, mm -hmm. it produces this sort of smoky effect and this is really clear and mm -hmm. contrasted. Yeah. So either the background needs a little bit more contrast, the bike maybe needs less, yeah. um, kind of a little bit closer in the middle is where yeah. you find that sweet spot. I definitely agree. <laughs> this is a really cool one. Good job on the masking, good job on the color. Um, I like the smoke in the bottom, yeah. yeah. I like how it's framed too. Yeah, really interesting story yeah. behind this, I'm yeah. sure. That's a really good <laughs> Juliana. one, Juliana. Great you job. To, you might have to share that one. What you yeah. were thinking there? All right, this is from Anel. Mm -hmm. Maybe they use that that tree um, that sky removal thing that I did. I don't oh, know. Oh yeah. But you can see how they they really did a good job on masking out the sky and then placing that image behind it. I'm not sure what technique they used, but good job. Yeah. Cool. It becomes really textural. All right, we got four left and maybe two minutes to do it. All right. This is fun. This is the mm -hmm. old technology yeah. where it goes to yeah. <laughs> the live one, out its life. The one thing I would add is maybe adding shadows and, and highlights to the sand that's burying the keyboard to make it seem like there is something under it. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. right now it looks like the keyboard is like broken in half mm -hmm. more than buried. I mm -hmm. assume they were going for the buried effect. Yeah. It's cool, it's impactful though. Yeah. I mean, yeah. first impression is really, you know, stunning colors. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's great. Another from Anel. Oh, nice. It's almost kind of like a, well, it's certainly sort of like double exposure effect, yeah. but really textural, mm -hmm. you know, trying to find some unique yeah. textures and shapes that come out. For sure. And oh, George. Nice. Yeah, so, so again, the, the one thing is that it seems like that um, splash is a little too bright. Just work on that. But concept is really cool. I like the um, earth, the sky in the back. It's super cool. 
good concept. I would just work on those details. And for most of these, that's that's the thing. Like you're, most of these are like 80% of the way there and they're 20% is just the little tiny details of fine tuning. Yeah. And I think this could have one really strong color direction that it's taken in, whether you continue with this sort of warm night sky or go blue or mm -hmm. introduce purple, something like that. I would assume a sky replacement maybe on this one. Um, maybe the people were adding think, in. Yeah, maybe yeah. just adding the people. Yeah, but both, in either case, either sky replacement or adding people is cool. We have the depth perception, so the, the woman in the front is, is in focus and mm -hmm. everything else seems to be out of focus, at least from my angle. Yeah. And I think that is it for this stream. So uh, in about five minutes, we've got Shauna Lynn coming on, Paul awesome. Trani's coming back out, more Photoshop magic, so stay tuned. There's another chance to submit um, for the daily challenge. There's another chance to win some free stickers. Um, and as always, thank you, Asus, no, for thank being you. here with us. We're gonna be back at the same time tomorrow and the next day. A lot more Photoshop tips and tricks coming, so stay tuned and join us tomorrow. See awesome, ya. see you tomorrow.